This video is a recording of the NDS Association webinar held on March 25th, 2021 about delivering data layers the smart way with NDS Live. Hello again and welcome to the NDS Association webinar. Today we will talk about delivering data layers the smart way with NDS Live. And before we look at the agenda of what we're covering today, allow me to promote the three video recordings of our previous webinars about the advantages of NDS Live for intelligent speed assistance, what is NDS Live, and reducing data consumption with NDS Live. We did these uh, in February and March, and the slides and full recordings are online. Uh, to see it, go to the news section on the NDS Association website at nds-association.org. Deep links are also shown on the slide uh, and I'm sharing that I'm sharing right now and like last time, uh, this webinar will be recorded and then shared on our website. Once available, we'll make a post on LinkedIn and on our website at nds-association.org. Please feel free to share this uh, with your peers and colleagues. Um, and with me today is Fabian Klebert. Uh, he's the technical coordinator of the NDS Association and CEO of Klebert Engineering. Uh, my name is Philip Robertus and I'm a senior product manager at HERE for automotive products and map publications. I hope you're sitting comfortably with a tea, coffee, water, or juice nearby for the next 60 minutes. Here's an overview of what we will cover today. Uh, first, I will share information about NDS and the automotive uh, market needs and how vehicle platforms and features as well as connectivity and fresh and live data play an increasingly important role. Then I will hand over to Fabian, who will share more about how data can be layered and consumed with NDS Live. And then we have reserved time for your questions. You can ask them anytime in the Q&A box and then uh, click the raise hand button. And we will then select you and to ask your question live and ideally with your video switched on so you can be part of the panel at the end. And no worries if you have a bad hair day or you don't feel comfortable asking questions live, you can simply ask anyway and anytime the Q&A box and then we will read and answer your question at the end. Now, since this webinar is about NDS Live, I will quickly introduce you to NDS. NDS is short for a navigation data standard. And it is the worldwide standard for map data in automotive ecosystems. The NDS Association was founded in 2009 by OEMs, application, service, map data, and computation providers. NDS based products are available in the market since 2012 and used globally in ADAS and navigation systems and development on the OEM side to use NDS for level three drive automation is well underway. Over 30 automotive OEM brands are using NDS maps today. NDS offers worldwide uh, maps and is globally adopted. Uh, NDS offers a well-defined spec for how to store map data and it allows flexibility for customized user experiences. The NDS specification covers the data model, the storage format, interfaces and protocols. And NDS is specifically for in-vehicle navigation and ADAS, for drive automation, it's for mobile companion apps, connected car, cloud solutions, and it involves with the market needs as NDS is for the automotive industry by the automotive industry. The advantage of an industry standard like NDS is that it creates this broad consensus in our industry on the best path forward made by the best engineers and experts available from multiple companies. Standardization consortia, may not be known for a fast pace. However, market driving association by like-minded companies, as is the case with NDS, demonstrated to have the right speed for the market. And as you can see on the slide, the NDS association has over 40 member companies that all collaborate and benefit from the automotive industry map data standard that NDS has. We started two years ago working on an evolution uh, of NDS that is smarter when bringing map data into connected cars and that keeps the cost of that connectivity in mind. The result of this evolution is NDS Live. Now, the market continues to change and the pace increases. Automotive vehicle platforms span over more and more models as OEMs are looking for greater scale and cost efficiencies and EV platforms will only accelerate this trend. Today, Map data needs to be much more detailed, precise, and fresher 
to support use cases like EV charging, assistance, navigation, and automated driving functions. Cars are now equipped with data connectivity and map data can be updated and streamed over the air. Selected features are powered and delivered by cloud systems. Not everything is done in the in-vehicle system any longer. Vehicle assistance and navigation features work in cloud systems and on in-vehicle systems alike. Vehicles are increasingly electrified and need live optimized routes and information about where to charge as well as reservations to change to, to the charge capabilities. We don't want to get there and then uh, the plugs are already taken. What it means is that features across the board need map data spanning from basic universal features that need a road network to more specialized features. So for example, from intelligent speed uh, assistance to ADAS, to basic navigation, to premium navigation, up to drive automation. With reducing the number of systems and ECUs down to one, we also acknowledge that bringing different data sets with overlap of map data attributes into vehicle doesn't make sense from a cost and data management perspective. All that data has to travel over a data connection, which creates cost. A modular approach is needed that allows map data layers to be consumed by cars according to their active feature set, while the architecture of the underlying system scales across the entire portfolio of features. And there is data that has very different shelf life. Some of that data doesn't need to be updated often. Map display data like cartoon features, 3D landmarks, or a digital terrain model are examples here. There is data that changes more often and needs frequent updates. And then there is data that you need in near real time and the system uses it only once. So understanding data shelf life and offering ways to consume and store data differently has a big impact on data consumption and data transfer costs. Reuse what you can, keep dynamic and live data in as small possible contexts. Let me give you a, a real life example here. If you're driving an electric or hybrid vehicle, then that vehicle will need data connectivity and ideally cloud-based live routing and recharging information as well as a reservation possibility. And all that with an EV charging network that grows daily and will continue to grow quite dynamically. A quarterly or monthly map update containing EV charging spots is not good enough. And actually, as a consumer, you want to know where you can actually charge, both in terms of locations, but also availability. And probably most important, is the charger accepting my charging provider ping token? The images on the slide here all show the same area and how different EV charging information is provided across different uh, user experience today. This is actually um, an example of myself. Um, you can see this is where I live, and you can see that some apps show more and actually some non-existing charging points. Uh, some show none at all. Uh, and then uh, there's my car plugged in at the actual point um, of, of uh, charging nearby. So now OEMs are, of course, integrating EV charging information into the navigation system, which you can see there on the left-hand side. And using that for charging is not always very user-friendly as it's tied to the OEM's charging payment offering. That may not work for consumers locally because the nearby charging spot is not supported. And you can even see there's a difference in what OEMs provide in the navigation system versus their own companion app on phones, uh, which is the next image to the right of the, the in-vehicle screen. And it doesn't mean that mobile apps always have an advantage. They can, but it can be a cause of bad user experience as well. So to cut this long story short, there's a need to fast track information sharing, to be able to layer data on a per needs basis, and then bring these layers as well as live information to cars. EV charging is just one example. There are large but also smaller regional data providers who by offering their data directly using NDS Live, they can participate in the automotive ecosystem. And that opens up the possibilities for OEMs and also for consumers to customize and configure the data that supports them best in a local market. For example, by adding local utilities or charging payment providers, charging points 
to the vehicle navigation system. So what we can actually use is right there uh, in the screen of your car. This is just one real world and present day example of how NDS Live enables a more diverse automotive ecosystem that consumers would benefit from. Other similar examples are in the POI, parking, venue map space, and I'm sure there are more pools of data that are rather small today, but enable innovative use cases and user experiences. And these will grow as their adoption increases. And a layered approach will enable feature configurations late at the point of delivery and later in the life cycle of the vehicle when it can be reconfigured for the used car market. So with NDS Live, the specification now supports these new requirements and use cases and thus combines the best of our experience with today's realities and tomorrow's new possibilities. It enables large players and small players to participate in the automotive ecosystem. That is why we say NDS Live is not a database, it is a distributed map data system. The NDS Association members work on NDS Live definitions and specifications since two years now. In the early summer of last year of 2020, five member companies formed the NDS Live joint development team. Electrobit here, join next, NAV Info and NNG. The result of the collaboration was then demonstrated at the first, uh, as the first implementations of NDS Live services by these five companies at the NDS public conference in September last year. Now, TomTom Tom will also join the NDS Live development team uh, in April as the sixth NDS member, and we welcome more companies to join. We work together here, share data, share applications, share experiences, know-how uh, to bring this uh, to market. Let me summarize before I hand over to Fabian uh, for the technical part. NDS Live is the worldwide standard for distributed map data and connected automotive ecosystems. It's built on the long experience of leading automotive OEMs, system vendors, and map data providers. The over 40 NDS member companies started looking at the evolving needs of connected cars, where software plays a major role in the consumer user experience. What is clear is that in our globalized markets, with its modular and scalable architecture, with embedded and cloud-based systems, with driver assistance leading to driver automation, we need to properly support all this in a better way than it was possible with the NES Classic specification. Modular and self-contained to minimize data consumption, downloading and caching data, enabling both embedded legal software and cloud systems. That is what NDS Live is. And as I said already, NDS Live was officially launched last year in September, and several NDS Association member companies are actively developing this to be production grade this year. Fabian has been key uh, to the definition of the new specification and driving the development forward. Uh, and I'm handing over to Fabian now and let him talk about the details of NDS Live, map data services, and smart layers. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, so also well, warm welcome from my side, everyone. Uh, if you joined one of the previous webinars, you may already be familiar with the smart layer concept. Uh, but for the ones who just joined today, let's quickly recap uh, what the smart layer concept is. The smart layer concept is at the heart of the data delivery in NDS Live. It allows to freely configure data layers in one container, the smart layer. The layout of the smart layer is always the same from a data configuration point of view. Um, only the type of it, either tile, path, or object, describes the spatial boundaries. So smart layer tiles, paths, or objects can be served over any network since NDS Live is not bound to any transport protocol. So whether the smart layer gets served over the internet <clears throat> sorry, or directly in the car doesn't make a difference. The encoding is always the same. It's always, and it always goes via the same interface. Today, we will be taking a closer look on what's going on under the hood of the smart layer concept and check out what usage possibilities we have. The example that I will explain shall give you some insights on the opportunities that this concept creates but may also give you some ideas how to utilize it. 
So it scales horizontally by adding more data layers as well as vertically by simply adding more services, potentially from different vendors. That's what uh, the whole game is about. But before we dive into details, let's take a look at the data layers that are already available in NDS Live today and which ones we still work on. Uh, the development focus on NDS Live in the first phase was clearly on ADAs and HD maps. So the most advanced layers that we have today are the road and the lane layers. The road layers, one for topology, one for geometry, they are the basis for SD ADAs maps and the lane layers, they serve as basis for the HD maps. So if you followed the other webinars closely, you may remember that we explained that these data layers are defined in separate specification modules. Uh, the data layers as shown in this slide are not ordered by their modules they are defined in. So not every layer is defined in its own module. For example, the driving rules layer for roads and the driving rules layer for lanes, they are defined in the same specification module, which is the rules module. So some of you may say now, hey, wait, you showed me some layers before and they went with the name of speed limits or EV charging layer. So what's going on? Where are they in this overview? So speed limits are part of the rules layer as speed limits are driving rules. Uh, they are accompanied by warning signs or driving restrictions and other attributes of roads and lanes that describe how to drive or better describing what is allowed and what not. So the same goes for the characteristics layers, which describe physical information of roads and lanes, such as road types, whether it's a highway or urban road, or the friction coefficient or type of pavement of a particular lane. So you can see on the right side, we'll take a look there, that we're now gradually moving towards completing the needed layers for navigation and infotainment as well. So expect to see them as official releases uh, during this summer. So I'll come back to the speed limit layer shortly, but before I would like to walk you through a short smart layering A101 so, to, so that we're all <clears throat> on the same page when entering the example and the discussions in the Q&A session later. An important takeaway from this session is that smart layers can be filled with an arbitrary amount of feature geometry and or attribute data layers. So the geometry layers need to go with its corresponding topology layers. For the attribute layers, you have two choices. Either you're using direct references to the map features, then the feature layer and the attribute layer have to go in one smart layer. Only in that case, the referential integrity is guaranteed. Or you're using indirect references. Then the attributes can travel alone in their own smart layer. The indirect references are, by the way, encoded in the same way as the paths that we have seen in the previous webinar when Otto showed you how to use the smart layer path services. Uh, by the way, if you missed that one, I would definitely recommend to watch that on the NDS EVs uh, YouTube channel after the session. It's a really good one. And of course, feature layers can also be used standalone without any attribute layers attached. Good. So now let's turn to the speed limit layer we talked about earlier. It is important to note, and this is especially important to remember for people who are familiar with the NDS classic way of using data layers. It is important to note that a smart layer can hold multiple data layers of the same type. That means that even if we do support more attributes than simply the speed limits, we do not have to put them all together in one layer. It can be as fine granular as you like it to be. So the bare minimum of an attribute layer is one attribute per attribute layer. Right? So speed limit is a good example for this. But of course, you can also pack the speed limits, warning signs, traffic lights, and restrictions all together into one rules layer as well. The NDS Live standard does not tie you to a specific layering layout. It gives you all the necessary freedom to scale with your project needs. So some app developers now may ask, but uh, how do I know where to find the speed limits then? Answer is the same and as simple as for all layers inside of a smart layer, check the metadata. That may look like a bit of overhead, but first of all, you need to do this only once per service. That means all tiles of a smart layer tile service have to have the same configuration, remember that? So you, remember, you may remember that, right? We talked about it in webinar two. 
And second, <clears throat> freedom and flexibility, of course, simply they come at a certain price. But uh, the NDS members were confident that this is a more future-proof approach than nailing down the exact layout of data layers for now and ever. Yeah, but still you may ask, what's the actual use case behind having the speed limits and the warning signs in two separate layers of the same type within one smart layer? Maybe this next slide explains this a little better. The reason for such a smart layer layout uh, will most likely have to do something with different configurations that you want to feed the speed limit layer to. Right? So in a setup like on the screen where we have three different configurations that we have to feed the speed limits to, it would mean that you would need to compile three different rules layers if they would not go with that fine granular filling that I explained earlier. So compiling three different layers simply means more effort. Right? It means more tests and in the, in the end, uh, more costs as well. So depending on how fine granular you want to serve the data later, this will influence your initial design of the data layers in a smart layer. Uh, but rest your head, you can always put them in a smart layer in the end and every NDS Live application will be able to read it just fine. So, Personally, I believe that we will see all kinds of approaches once NDS Life is in the field. So from layers that contain only one or two attributes to layers that squash together all the attributes from one specification module, since their clients need everything anyhow. So yeah, now that we have learned that we can literally throw together all kinds of data layers with all kinds of references, let's roll an example where we can see how this is all utilized. In this example, we bring in several smart layer services from different vendors, showing you how you can scale a map data system vertically as well. So we have a map from a conventional map vendor. We add some data from the car maker itself. We add one parking garage data vendor that is specialized on HD map for their parking facilities and some dynamic data from yet another vendor that provides dynamic speed limits, plus some POIs from an EV charging network company. So we won't dive into the map vendor too much this time. It shall simply serve as the example for a basic map, for instance, for ISA or ADAS use cases. Uh, the OEM fleet data layers in this example contain speed limits that the OEM has recorded with its own sensors. In addition to that, it also carries a thin layer of road geometries that are used to reference the data to. For the ones that attended the previous webinar, you may remember the same approach has been shown by Otto. Instead of using indirect references, simply add some geometries of your own so that the map matchers can use this. Uh, what we see here the first time is a custom layer. So if you ever work with a car maker on map data, make sure you bring the ability to add a, at least a small custom layer, right? It seems that they can't just go without. Uh, so NDS Life, of course, also foresees the ability to add custom data layers uh, to a smart layer container. So if you need to add some extra special map data to make your head-up display look even cooler, or your DLP headlights need to print some stuff on the road, put it there, at least until we really make a standard out of it. So, but back to the example. Next up is a parking facility map vendor that only provides HD maps for parking garages. So your car is able to automatically park there. Uses a smart layer object service for that case. And the dynamic data provider that we see below uh, adds dynamic or live speed limit information to the mix and uses indirect references for this. That means that the client application will need to match these speed limits onto the road network from the map vendor's base map. And last but not least, the EV charging company that offers its charging POIs uh, also using indirect references. So now we have four different vendors and the car maker itself in the mix, and all of them are using one interface, right? The smart layer service interface. The application developers, they can focus on the implementations of the data usage from the data layers and really the features and they do not have to fight with integrating different service APIs for each and every service. And we can even add more services of the same kind to the mix later during project lifecycle without having to update the application software in the car. So whether we add a new provider for parking garages or a new EV charging network is offering its services in NDS Live now, we can simply add their services into the service registry 
the application and the car will treat them as if they had always been there. And the driver is happily able to drive up to the next available EV charger in the parking garage nearby and does not need to switch between like five different mobile apps like Philip showed before, by one or not. Yeah, and to conclude matters, we also add a growing number of application services to this example, like routing services, EV range projection service, or horizon assist. Some of those we talked about in the webinars earlier. <clears throat> so I hope you could get some uh, more insights on the way Andy's life deals with data layers today. And uh, yeah, and if there are any questions left, I'll be happy to answer them in the upcoming Q&A session. So, uh, but before we do so, and before we go there, um, let me tell you, this is not all only paperwork, right? Uh, we at the NDS Association, we support our members by a number of online and up and running smart layer demo servers that actually serve data as you have seen on the slides before. Uh, the NDS islands, which are small sample maps are actually all deployed as web services that help NDS members to accelerate their first steps in migrating to NDS Live. So at the moment, we're running five separate services for five islands. Some of them have different specification module versions so that members can already experience what it means when they have to deal with a highly modular specification. So uh, these are de deployed as HTTP REST services. They're using open API to describe, uh, describe the transport protocol. Um, you remember the uh, architecture maybe from web webinar two where we said we have this reference layers. This is actually where that sits. So there's also a demo service registry running and we'll enhance this during its lifetime to hold more and more reference and uh, demo services. Yeah, the uh, NDS Association maintains this playground for NDS Live developers to be able to quickly learn how to master the smart layers. And they act also as a reference to improve the interoperability already in an early phase of the development. Yeah, having said that, would like to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the NDS Live webinar series, and I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, in the Q&A. So back to you, Philip. Thank you, Fabian. Yeah, we're now uh, going into the interactive part of our webinar. If you have questions, uh, please submit them in the Q&A window, and then your question will be answered by our panel of experts. Raise your hand if you would like to uh, be part of the discussion, part of the panel, and uh, be on video and, and ask your question live. That has worked really well for us in the past. So now I welcome our panelist, uh, Otto, who Fabian uh, referred to many times, Otto Niro, who is a product manager at NNG. We have Nico Glorious on the panel, a product manager at NAF Info, and also vice president, uh, vice chairman, sorry, of the NDS Association. We're very active there. Fabian Klebert is the technical coordinator of the NDS Association, and myself, Gilbertus, uh, here. As I said, you can be on the panel too. Submit your questions in the Q&A box. I see we have one already. Uh, if you want to uh, be on video, raise your hand, uh, and we'll add you uh, to the panel as well. There's a raise your hand button uh, in the WebEx interface there, and then we'll put you to the panel. Good. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all see the group over here. Let's see what Good. So here we go. The first questions are rolling in. So maybe let's simply start with the first one, pretty technical one. So I would be doing that. Are you also using, so Peter Smith is actually um, asking, are you using rest layers, uh, rest for layers with high dyna dynamics or do you also have a mechanism for notifying vehicles of ephemeral or mural layer updates? So yeah, we do, we, we're not only working on rest. So we also support uh, some, some push uh, mechanisms. So there's besides the service interfaces that NDS Live um, uh, defines, we also have a definition of topics. So for a publish subscribe uh, way. So simply um, for for the webinars, we have now we have focused on on the services. But yes, there is um, there's also push notifications uh, available as part of this. So um, yeah, but 
they're not going to be doing it for complete for huge data sets right it's going to be smaller data or information that you for instance need to update something or you can push like like you said um very you, for looking at intersection use cases where you want to probably have live traffic lights uh service or so you could you, you can use that there Good. Uh, Youngduk So is asking, do you have a suggested server-side modules? Once the server-side provides all of the requests from client to compose smart layer and every REST call, it seems to be very busy. Um, to be honest, so I, I mean, if this question goes into how, if NDS uh, suggests what kind of uh, server-side architecture to use no it's not so this is actually up to uh, up to up to everyone i don't uh, you, you may have seen like uh, like otto what, what he presented last time that would probably need a different way of of dealing with in the uh, in, in the cloud than if you simply only send out some uh, some static data and I think uh, one part of this is also that the data layers can be pre-compiled -pre by the data providers and then offered as a smart layer. So that is, for the more static data, absolutely possible. It doesn't need to be compiled on the fly, right? So data that is dynamic and changes often, that is served up uh, in a live way, but a lot of other data is honestly fairly static uh, and is updated then uh, from from hourly, daily, weekly, to even monthly, uh, wherever, or how that makes sense. I mean, as I said earlier, we want to minimize uh, the data consumption and some of that data rarely changes. Uh, so let's keep that stable uh, and pre-compile it and offer it up as a smart data. Yeah, and for that, we also have different mechanisms, right? So we have the, the static data, with, which has a versioning mechanism, mechanism with a version ID. We have dynamic and, and live data to really distinguish between these and to, to optimize also the, the transfer um, of these different um, yeah, types of, of data. Okay. Yeah, are there any other questions? So Seems like today is a little more silent than the other days, but well, we, of course, um, while you guys are still for if, if, if you want to join the discussion, I mean, we can still talk about where this uh, series of webinars will go uh, into the, the future right now. So our first focus now was on um, on, on giving you an introduction. So we, we discussed it internally um, a little bit on where to go next. So we had some ideas. So, um, but we would also like to see whether you, uh, what you guys have been missing in, in the last four webinars, right? Where you say, hey, why don't you make a webinar, another series of two, four, uh, webinars in the early summer. So basically we'll make a break now for the next uh, two, three, four weeks. Uh, but then we'll come up, we plan again to to entertain you with some of the webinars here. And um, yeah, we discussed, so what could be next, right? And um, so please also drop your ideas in the chat or in the Q and A box and uh, so if, if, if you would like to see any, any um, focus topics. Exactly. So we've, we've thought about um, POIs, for example, uh, Philip already mentioned um, all these issues around EV charging stations and so on, having multiple providers and, and networks over there, combining these. Um, we also thought about combining NDS Classic and NDS Lives, um, such topics. So if there are any special topics you'd like to see in the upcoming webinars, then yeah, feel free to add your proposals to the Q&A. And maybe one, one comment to, to Fabian's presentation that that was exactly the reason why, why NNG joined the, the NDS Live uh, development, because NNG was always a, a provider agnostic. 
application uh, supplier. And, and we had to, to integrate any kind of, of services, map services that was requested by the customers. And, and it, it was always not that easy to, to integrate them and also make it available during the lifetime of the project. But when it comes to NDS life, uh, our life would be much, much, much easier. And, and that's what we have already realized. So we, uh, inside the, the NDS Live dev team, we got access to, to so many services, NDS Live services, that we can uh, already check the, the interoperability of these, of these services and, and also the, uh, the resource that we need to, to integrate them. Okay, I muted myself because, uh, yeah, go ahead. It's a little noisy here, so. Oh, I don't, we don't hear the noise, at least I don't. So Thomas uh, is asking here uh, or suggesting a webinar on the use of NDS tools. I think that's a good idea, actually, to show um, some of the tools that are available to NDS members and those who want to uh, do an eval and participate here. So we'll take that suggestion up. Thanks, Thomas. Um, Peter had another question here. Then I'm going to read. A uh, typical legal application will likely use multiple different providers exposing data via the service bus. NDS Live effectively offers a toolbox. So the roles of the involved parties are not predefined. Who do you envision envisioning uh, providing and maintaining a service bus? Practical yeah, I, I would say um, it will be probably so. Ba ba basically, who's who's running that 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 non-defined backend, right? Or whether it's going to be REST services or whatever. So, so I think that will be the there will be for each and every um, car project or each and every um, application vendor. We'll say, okay, we gonna uh, to get in that car project. We're gonna use these kind of transport protocols. So they will like in in a separate contract or saying, okay, we're gonna use NDS Live for sure. But then in addition, you will need to make um, make certain assumption or, or basically you need to define that in a project. Okay, to be really completely interoperable in the end, we have we have to use uh, certain uh, protocols for this and that. Whether it's gonna be in the car. Whether going to, it's going to be from cloud to car and so on and so forth. So I think, but 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 that is usually probably in most cases people will fall back uh, to standards that are already there, and um, so that kind of integration work still needs to be done. That's for sure. And we see that probably. So I envision that probably being the OEM in the lead together with all the with all the first. Um, with a, let's say with, with with their first team of suppliers, right? They they may take in some more suppliers later on, and they will simply have to stick with what is already there. Right? I guess I don't know how you guys yeah. see. It. Yeah, as you said, that totally depends on on the project setup. So there is a quite very uh, quite big variety of, of these setups, and you know. Um, Sometimes the OEM and itself handles all these suppliers themselves. Uh, sometimes uh, th on the other end, you have one uh, tier one taking care of, of all that stuff. Sometimes you have an integrator or you have a map service provider who is completely taking over the part of, of the maps uh, doing the DSD and, and HD and do, doing um, cross reference and map matching and doing also the integration of, of POIs and these different services. So yeah, it really depends on, on the project setup. Yeah, and then uh, an anonymous participant is asking, with the introduction of HD lane level map data, how do you handle, for example, a road where the lanes in one direction lie on a different tile than the lanes going in the other direction? Um, that's pretty simple, we don't, uh, we're not super strict on where the where, where the geometries or whatever have to go. So where the major part of the road is, everything goes into that tile, even if geometries are a little bit outside. So it, it's not the case any longer in NDS Live, uh, like there was in, in, in NDS Classic, that you cannot actually encode it over the, over the tile border. So 
So basically, if you would take a look at the data in the end, it may no, not look like exactly tiled, uh, but because there may be like the very small parts that are going out and going in again or, or things like that, they may reach over the tile border a bit. And yeah, because cutting it exactly at the tile border, it, it, it gives you so many, uh, so many headaches when you, and so many special cases you need to deal with. We simply said, okay, let's, Simplify this, the, the, the tiles are more like, the tiling schema is more like a spatial index and it's gonna be a container. And of course we should not, it, it should not reach out too wide into another tile um, and to include it, but basically, yeah, give it a little, a little freedom with the map compilers, a little freedom to, um, yeah, to put what uh, into what tile. So it looks more like puzzle pieces. <laughs> Yeah, hope it's not real puzzle pieces like big ones, right? <laughs> it's more because this then actually that's yeah. Um, Peter is again asking, does any slide include any mechanism to hide tile boundaries for the application builder? Um, the application, yeah, actually the, I mean the the tile mechanism is the spatial index that we're having. So an application builder has to deal with it because the, the, the good thing about a, um, a, about a fixed tiling mechanism is that you can exactly for each and every uh, geo position in the world, you can by, by not having to go to an index or whatever, but simply by a, a very, very short calculation, you can find out in which tile you are. And that means, um, so, so that's the power of that um, uh, tiling schema. So of course the, the application builder needs to be aware of it. Later on, whether it needs to connect, uh, and it also needs to be aware that it can get these things in tiles and that in tile, uh, in, in the tile, um, on the tile borders, it needs to stitch together uh, the, the, the data. So, it can't go without completely uh, knowing the tile boundaries or knowing the tiling scheme. And, and for example, let's take the example I, I presented on the last webinar. Uh, normally the, uh, the past data shouldn't be packed uh, in a tile. But we decided to make it to make the concept even more um, even more simply, and and I also decided to to display the the tiling information on the screen uh, because sometimes it's easier to to explain the situation when when we see the the, the tile borders as well. But normally uh, we don't have to to deal with. That the tie borders. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So yeah, for the future um, stuff, so tools, yeah, definitely. And that's well taken. I think we can talk a lot about them. We could, um, yeah. yeah, that is also a different approach. You talk a little bit. In Fragen, do we talk a little bit more about what happened, what's ready uh, for implementation, what the teams are currently working on to uh, get the specification uh, more complete? And currently, we focused on on the more basic uh, foundation in the past, right, and ADAS, and then uh, to support use cases for uh, automated driving. Yeah. I think what we still need is what, what you've seen dashed in my overview of the uh, thing is localization. It's basically, um, it will be in most parts, it will be simply a, a takeover from NDS Classic. So there will be localization landmarks, there will be um, obstacles and all, all of these layers. And, um, but we still have to transfer them over. Uh, to, to NDS Live uh, because we there have a little bit of different storage of geometries and, and stuff. Um, 
we have more and more members also we have some members that are not yet on the on the dev team so if you looked at the slide you've seen these five and now six uh, companies that are really showcasing hey we're working on this but also there are some hidden uh, players i would say that already also working and, and are contributing uh, especially in the field of um, navigation right so so we, we had requests from some members to say okay can we, shall we work on the PUIs, for instance? Uh, we, we've looked at it. it, it uh, we think we need to improve this a little more because, so I think they're more like focusing on the, so uh, I would say we started with HD, HD map, auto drive map, ADAS map. And uh, next is going to be probably um, like the EV stuff. Yeah, right. So, so you for EV, you need the, the like the POIs for the uh, for the charging stations and stuff like that. We we will probably enhance the routing uh, application service and so on. Um, I mean, we already have the the EV range uh, calculation service for this, and um, then and then I think we gradually move on to uh, completing uh, other things like display and stuff as well. That hasn't been in, in the focus. And then, of course, we what we also have on the roadmap is to how to integrate. And this is where the um, the NDS product definition group um, works on is is how can we integrate with like the the solutions like CarPlay, uh, like Android Auto, where where you basically see okay, we need to somehow we're getting some some customer brought in navigation into the car. And but we somehow need to connect this because we have some some in, in most cases now with ISA, of course, we have internally running some system uh, that is basically that the user doesn't see right it just simply it, it may be it, it influences the driving a little so it slows you down uh, and so on, but it doesn't have like a huge display or whatever. But the thing is, integrating these two worlds together, I think that that is a major part that we also have to focus on within the next one uh, one year, definitely. Uh. And Fabian, you mentioned uh, people who are bringing in their smartphones. And, and personally, I believe one of the, the motivations for that is that in the past, map data uh, that was fairly static, uh, was more of a quarterly or sometimes even just an annually consumed update, was out of date at times. It was mm. complicated to update uh, a mobile phone. Um, was offering fresh maps, live information of traffic. But that's going to change, or it has changed already. And NDS Live is really taking that into account. Like, how can we make use of the upcoming 5G speed, um, mm. data connectivity, using the large screens that many OEMs now start deploying in their premium uh, and even mid-range vehicles, right? So you have a lot of real estate and a, and a great integration into the car head-up displays are becoming more advanced. Uh, if you look at what some of the OEMs are doing in terms of augmented reality, and that consumes data, uh, but you may not want to bring all that data into a car in a, in a monthly or weekly or quarterly package or whatever. You may want to bring that data into a car on a more per needs basis and with a smart caching and, and, and updating mechanism. And that's, mm. that's what we've talked about in practice preparation of this webinar as well, like how great NDS Live is actually geared towards these use cases where you have a, a feature stack from something fairly basic, like speed limited for ISA up to something like an advanced uh, reality head-up display that is integrated into the vehicle user experience and, and how you consume that data in layers uh, right and, and that, 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 is, that is basically the idea of the of, of these data layers right we we wanted to we said from the beginning we know that it's going to be evolving but we don't want to evolve always saying yeah there's a new service interface and you have to and and people people like otto's colleagues from ng they have to again and again fight with the new API and whatever for this new service for that new service. So that's what we said, okay, we're gonna do one service. So you, you have the, the service access and all of that you have covered, right? 
And then it's simply about, okay, what's inside of the package? And if there's something new, okay, I'll pass it to a module inside of my software that knows it. And if I don't have that module, it just we're just simply skipping that layer, right? But like, like I said, uh, I, I took the example of the, the, the like we said, head-up display or the DLP headlights or whatever kind of thing. If you have data for it, in, at the beginning, we, you can simply create a custom layer, but I think we'll, we'll be gradually also moving towards this because these will be the requirements that the OEMs will bring in and say, okay, we now have a custom layer and yeah, but it's not rocket science. It's not, it's not our own magic, right? So maybe, maybe it, it, is, it is in the future, it's better that we simply share it and say, okay, this is how we did our custom layer and, and the rest of the NDS guys. That's how it usually it goes in NDS, right? It looks at it, says, yeah, we, we basically have the same thing. Uh, let's sit down together and make one specification for this. And, and you will see, and that will easily fit into the architecture of these smart layer uh, containers. Yeah, I also wanted to, to highlight another topic, um, which fits a little bit to, uh, to the last question of, of Peter here. Mm -hmm. So also still migration is a big topic. Um, migration in the one sense, um, going from NDS Classic to NDS Live with, with all the pre-investments uh, companies have, have done and um, uh, also with, with um, uh, not quite the problem, but uh, that we don't have all the, the modules and have, haven't covered all the use cases yet. So you, we still have to uh, combine NDS Classic and NDS Live services to have a full feature set right now. That's the one thing uh, we're also focusing on now. And um, the other migration path is also, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice and uh, we are clear on the vision to, to have live data as much as possible, but there are still um, areas where you don't have full 5G coverage or where it's just too expensive. And you still want to use the same solution um, there that you are using in, in other parts of the world. So we're also now looking into uh, how we could pre-install uh, maps in, in devices or cars in areas where you don't have that connectivity to, to be able to, to use the same interfaces like you're doing in the other parts. And, and just to add to, to Nico that um... The, for, the first solution we, we introduced with NDS Live was basically a migration uh, project so that we, we reused the, the already existing NDS, and NDS Classic based uh, navigation solution. But we added the, the HD lane layers from NDS Live and we screened it uh, on the fly. And, and that we can easily um, enhance the functionality of the navigation system by adding, uh, let's say, HD lane based IVI solution, IVI features, functionalities. So that's, I would say that's, that's also the advantage of, of NDS Live. So you don't have to throw away the, 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 all the NDS classic investment that we made in the past. We can, we can reuse it and we can gradually migrate uh, to NDS Live by, by adding, let's say, EV uh, functionalities or, or, or uh, HD lane based uh, uh, new features. That's 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 a very easy to enter uh, in this life. Yeah, and and to answer uh, Yongduk's uh, question, yes, it is. Um, so he was asking, do we have plans to extend the contents, for example, uh, digital terrain model or traffic or speech uh, and so on. And yes, it is. So it will be. So, so the ultimate goal is, of course, to have the same feature set as if we had an NDS Classic, right? So, um, but it was purely by by having to look at uh, by having to focus on, on on certain areas first. We said, okay, HD maps, and then um, navigation infotainment. And actually, traffic is quite quite easy when when it comes to live. Yeah approach so let's take uh, the, the cloud routing uh, solution so we also implemented a NDS live routing service where the traffic is already taken into account in the background that's it yeah good and there's one interesting question I know you guys left this up for, for the for the last minute right and nobody wants to answer it 
So, so how far are we from the first deployed OEM applications? <laughs> So, well, I personally hope that uh, we can win some first customers for the ISA use cases, uh, not, not only as here, but also uh, as, a, as a group of companies engaging in India's life, uh, India's association, because I think it's really a great fit for uh, the promise of combining uh, static data with live data uh, over the same uh, definitions and interfaces and bringing data into a car around the smart home zone and, and prefetching or caching data uh, along a path uh, and when the route is actually calculated. So I think it's a perfect use case for minimizing data consumption and having uh, fresh data in a vehicle. Uh, and as you may know, the ISA regulation kicks in next year. Uh, it's just uh, coming out of Brussels uh, yesterday, the news that uh, it's very likely going to stay uh, with the July 2022 um, timeline for new type approvals and then uh, from July 2024 onwards uh, for every new registered car in the European Union. So that's pretty near term for the auto industry to get something like this scaled out to all vehicles who currently don't have any data cell navigation system, which is about 40% of the total 16 million uh, of vehicles that are newly registered every year in the European Union now. So. so we could answer that and say probably within a year or two, right? So that's, yeah. Yeah. Gotta be production ready this year, actually, at the end of it, because yeah, yeah, right. usually the, the test will run six months ahead of launch. So, yeah. I think a lot of companies are working full time on, on getting that ready. Good, then we'll wrap it up. Um, quickly, I want to uh, give you the uh, contact details of Markus Juncker. Markus Juncker is our NDS Association Administrator, and we we'll be happy to hear from you if you are interested in test driving NDS live and applying for an evaluation. Um, as we said earlier, we have tools uh, and data sets uh, ready to work with, really welcoming additional participants in the development, sharing their needs, sharing their experience. Uh, um, oh, by the way, are you sharing a screen? Ah, yeah, now it's screen sharing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here's Markus Juncker's uh, email address. You can always also go to our website at nds-association.org. There's also a contact form uh, on the bottom of the page where you can uh, quickly submit a message and Markus will get that. Uh, as I said earlier, we have all the, uh, the previous webinars, uh, the recordings of them on our website. And if you follow us on LinkedIn, uh, you will be kept up to date uh, with new news, uh, as well as with uh, announcements about possible additional webinars that we're doing to share where we are, to share uh, more of uh, where we're going uh, and what's ready. Uh, so today's session uh, is recorded and we're going to post that uh, on YouTube soon again on LinkedIn and on our website, we'll then share the, the link uh, to that recording and the slides as well. So you can also then download the slides uh, from our website. Yeah, and that's really it for today. Uh, many thanks. Okay. I'd like to take the opportunity um, to, to thank all the, uh, the people that made this webinar possible. Um, so especially thanks to you, Philip, as our marketing coordinator, and then thanks to Fabian, um, as our technical uh, coordinator, also, thanks to the other panelists we had uh, from, from here, from MMG, from Electrobit, VW, and also my colleagues from um, North Info. So I hope we have been able to uh, yeah, show you some of the advantages of uh, NDS Live. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the next season of this webinar. Thanks a lot. Okay, hope to see you there. Take care, bye. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you for watching. Visit our website for news on NDS at nds-association.org.